called ATV and we are our Bill staff, Siorka, yeah. and let's start talking about the concept of, of a big ball of mud. What is it? So big ball of mud is not originally my term, uh, but I think it, it captures really well a certain kind of software where there are no boundaries, no structures that you can really count on. Everything just kind of flows into everything else. And so a lot of the design rules that we like to rely on just don't really benefit you very much within a big ball of mud. You know, in DDD we might talk about aggregates and how important it is to uh, to have boundaries around some of your data that, that you can manage the, the transactional integrity of these. Well, within a big ball of mud, aggregates are kind of an illusion more often than not. And if you start trying to apply things like that, it just it just doesn't work. It just kind of, you know, the, the mud will just flow in. And so a lot of systems become that when they get old because after a while people you know, are not as disciplined as they usually are at the beginning of a project. And so that's an expression that's come to be used. Okay, uh, you talk about uh, the aggregate as one of those boundaries that we can that we can use, and there is another concept uh, called bonded context, and uh, you, uh, you put on a slide mm -hmm. about don't repeat yourself yes. is for inside one bonded context. Yeah. Why? Explain it, please. All right. So there are different kinds of boundaries that we need to be aware of. And, and uh, for example, an aggregate boundary that you mentioned, that's a boundary around some uh, information that we want to maintain some kind of integrity around, you know, transactional integrity. And so if we're processing messages, how do we update an entire aggregate uh, simultaneously in response to a message as opposed to say, well, this aggregate over here can be updated asynchronously. So this is about runtime, you know, about maintaining the data in runtime. Mm -hmm. A bounded context is a different kind of boundary. It's around conceptual integrity of a design. So if I'm saying I'm going to call this thing a customer, maybe customer doesn't mean the same all the time to everyone. Uh, to salespeople, customer means one thing. To uh, the people who have to ship the packages, it means another thing. So we don't want to just assume that everyone means the same thing. And that's the kind of boundary that a bounded context is. And you'll say, within this part of our software, you can trust that we've used language consistently, that the rules that we've stated are consistent, if you want to use a pattern like bounded, uh, like aggregates, mm -hmm. you need to do it within one of these bounded contexts because it's a very rigorous set of assertions you're making. And I can't make rigorous assertions that apply globally. You know, I can't say that uh, there are always fewer than 10 of these. Uh, well, uh, I can within a bounded context. I can make an assertion like that and we can verify that it's true. I can't say that in general. So. When I talked about don't repeat yourself being a principle that applies to one bounded context, what I mean is that it's a rigorous kind of thing. It's saying you need to, first of all, understand everything that's going on well enough to even recognize duplication. So dry, remember, is basically a way of avoiding duplication of concepts, duplication of logic. In order to do that, the first thing you have to do is be able to recognize duplication. But in a large system, how do you even know that someone else has done something essentially very similar to what you're doing? You don't even know. And if you did put in the investment that would be needed to even find that out, then what do you do? You say, well, these two otherwise completely independent systems, we're going to factor this thing out. We're both going to depend on that. And now these two systems will have to be coordinated forever. The overhead of that is so costly that it's there's very seldom would the thing you're being that you're duplicating be valuable enough to justify the coordination overhead and the additional risk to the project. Occasionally it is, but usually not. But usually you won't even know. So 
rather than make these uh, set these goals, which some people would say, well, it's just a kind of a goal. We don't expect them to reach it. Well, I say instead of doing that. Let's set a different goal, a more appropriate goal, which is within a bounded context where we really are trying to get some rigor and some consistency. Then dry really helps you do that. Voiding duplication keeps the interior of the bounded context very tidy. Mm -hmm. So, and also because the scope is limited, and you're expecting that the team communicates a lot about what's going on, it is realistic to think that you will actually know about duplication. Most of the time, none of these rules are perfect. So, <clears throat> so it's realistic to maintain a very low level of duplication within a bounded context, and it's also beneficial. Whereas, across a large system, outside the bounded context, in another bounded context, or in a ball of mud somewhere, there's very likely to be duplication you don't know about. And when you do know about it, the 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 ways that we have of eliminating that duplication are very likely to be worse than a little bit of duplication. Okay, I'm talking about just jumping into all this stuff and um, trying to start putting putting into practice it. Uh, for instance, when we have to define bounded context, we already have a big bound map, so we want to start doing a refactor towards this line of towards this this kind of thinking so how will you um, orchestrate that at the strategy at the strategic level i mean yeah. how do we define bonnet context how? so let's say you're in a ball of mud or it isn't necessarily a ball of mud yeah. uh, but maybe an old-fashioned monolithic system now there are people who really have focused on how to reorder legacy systems. You know, Michael Feathers comes to mind as one of the more uh, sophisticated thinkers on that. And they have things like uh, the strangler pattern and all these. And I think that's good. Uh, it isn't usually my approach and what people usually want me involved for anyway. We say, look, what is something Why is it important to us to do this? It may be that actually the legacy system is taking care of the needs of the business pretty well. And we're able to make modest changes to it. And the business only needs modest changes. It's not a business mm -hmm. that's in rapid flux. But, if every, but maybe there's a real reason, right? Oh, we need a radical change to this thing, to this particular way of doing business. We need it because the business has changed and we need to keep up. And we are finding that we can't change the legacy system that much or not fast enough. Maybe because it's a big ball of mud, in which case it's hard to make any significant change. Maybe it's just structured, it's clean enough, but it's just structured fundamentally differently. They thought about the business a different way, they built the software a different way. So what I like to do in that case is to say, let's create a bubble, a different bounded context, all new, and we will really, with the business people, identify a narrow part of this that's very important that we are having trouble doing over here. And with that small scope, we will try to build that part over here, something strategically important complex enough that it justifies this and that somewhere for some reason is not easy to do in the legacy system in this isolated external part it could be a separate service for example we will we will design it differently new language everything uh, clean and communicate with the legacy system through a trend anti corruption layer, layer. anti corruption layer which will take, let's say, messages from our new system and convert them into whatever the legacy systems understand. For instance, sorry, mm -hmm. but for instance, we could say that the new system will produce domain events and put them into a queue, mm -hmm. and then we have an intermediate uh, little system which just uh, reads and consumes 
uh, those events and produce API calls to the legacy one? Exactly. Okay, perfect. And in terms of the legacy, or if it's an old-fashioned system that doesn't really have APIs, then maybe that means it has to do database calls, right? And it will read the queue and each message, each uh, domain event that we've produced, it will say, well, this domain event means that we need to do this kind of operation and update in the database or insert into the database over in the legacy system. But you see that the new system doesn't have to understand any of that, and the old system is not being modified at all. And that piece in the middle we call an anti-corruption layer. It protects the old system from being, because the old system is doing a lot of important work. And it protects the new system from just eventually looking exactly like the legacy system. Because sometimes people try this, they don't isolate the new system enough, and so naturally the concepts are pulled more and more toward the concepts of the legacy, and you end up just having uh, something that looks a lot like the old one. This is the, my preferred approach. And I, I notice, though, it started with identifying something kind of special, something strategically important with some intricate uh, logic in it that makes it difficult to do in some other way and uh, that we've found difficulty doing in the legacy system. So now, now we start. We create what I call a bubble context. Mm -hmm. And then from there you might create another bubble context. You might grow this one a little bit. And, uh, but your goal is not replace the legacy system. That isn't our goal at all. In fact, in this case, our goal is not even to improve the legacy system. Although sometimes that's a nice thing to do, but it isn't really my specialty, and I don't think that it is necessary in order to go down this path. Eric, uh, thanks a lot for your time. It it is a pleasure to talk with you and uh, so close and and, and, and and to have you here. And uh, I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference and see you later. Thank you. Gracias. <laughs>